Dear everyone, greetings from Asian Productivity Organization. Hope everyone is doing great and healthy. This is live from the APO Secretariat Office in Tokyo, Japan, and we welcome all of our viewers from APO member countries and beyond. I am Asai Tambi Monikam, and thanks to our viewers for joining us on this APO Productivity Talk series. And today we will discuss about startup-centric innovation, particularly focusing on policies. Innovation is a complex, diverse, and multifaceted process. The term refers to new, significantly different products and processes that improve productivity and benefit users. Innovation occurs through a wide range of activities carried out by a variety of actors. Some innovations are game changers, such as the mobile phones that left landline phones to gather dust. Much more common are incremental innovations, such as those that create more and better futures in mobile phones. Startups are a catalyst for economic growth by globally in and locally. Startups are known for their ultra high mortality rate. On average, only about 10% of all startups survive and become full fledged business enterprises. The remaining 80 to 90% find themselves in the back hole containing all other startups that unfortunately did not survive this highly competitive industry. Although hundreds of millions of startups sprout every year, not all make the cut. Moreover, it takes so long on successful if they address an unmet need. Apart from driving economic recovery, startups and scale-ups also need to drive the mindset shift record for adoption of their technologies and ideas. Recently, many member countries in Asia, including Japan, are encouraging and creating a conducive ecosystem for startups to support and grow their business. However, the efforts taken by member governments sometimes not enough to support the startups, particularly on policy front. Hence, it was essential to study at global level startup centric innovation policy and today our guest speaker will share her insights through this p talk on the research results of such study on startup centric innovation policy dear viewers i am very much delighted to welcome our guest speaker dr robin klingler withdraw visiting us at apo secretariat for joining us this productivity talk and it's our privilege to host this session with her Dr. Robin is an Associate Dean for Global Engagement and Reader in Entrepreneurship and Sustainability at King's Business School, London, UK. Dr. Robin is teaching Economics of Impact and Innovation for Executive MBA and Venture Financing for Postgraduate Students. On research front, she is supervising PhD students and published many research articles and published books related with entrepreneurship and inclusive innovation policy. She had also recently associated with APO as chief expert for one of the APO's research projects on inclusive innovation policies for economic growth. Dear viewers, before I invite Dr. Robbins to start her presentation, we would like to encourage our viewers to send your questions and comments in the chat box with your name and country, and we would respond to your questions during Q&A session. Dr. Robin, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Asai-san, for the introduction and for the opportunity to join the P Talk today here from Tokyo at the Asian Productivity Organization. I'm delighted to, to join and to have the opportunity to share what's the culmination of a number of research projects that I've been working on for the last six years. I'll start by saying that this project is going to look at the, the intersection or the convergence of government support for startups in the context of the wider economy, particularly corporates and incumbent firms. This project was motivated, this wider project was motivated by a research quote uh, that I heard six years ago this month 
uh, in Seoul when interviewing government policymakers about startup-centric innovation policy. A policymaker remarked that the reason that supporting startups was, was occurring, why it is important, is because the startups were meant to inject innovative DNA into the chebol, into the large firms. So this motivated the research project looking at what well, what's what's sort of the point of supporting startups? What are startups and why are they meant to inject innovative DNA into large firms? So the agenda or what I have the pleasure to speak with you about today has two major points or prongs motivated by this, this observation that the point of supporting startups along the lines of what asai Sun mentioned is about this creativity, about cultural shift, about mindset, and about boosting the productivity for the economy. It's worth starting with some definitions, uh, like Asai Sun did as well. So we're going to look in depth at what is a startup from a public policy perspective. But I'll first say that a startup is broadly understood as a new entrant, right? a new firm. And there's something about it being innovative, maybe being technologically oriented. And we're going to look at this in particular, what exactly does this mean? I'm going to talk about innovation, uh, which was also mentioned in the introduction, that innovation being a new product or process about commercialization, not only invention. And then second, how does the support of startups link with the wider economy, in particular existing firms? And we're going to look at the work of Joseph Schumpeter in motivating whether startups are meant to drive creative destruction, a process whereby they challenge the existing industrial paradigm and technologies, or about boosting the productivity of incumbent firms, of existing firms. Okay, so those are the two questions. And so now on your screen, you'll see the first of the four questions within that, what is a startup? And so I'm just framing these, these questions. So, as I said, a startup is conceived as this engine of economic growth. From the perspective of Joseph Schumpeter, startups are, are incredibly important to driving processes of advanced innovation. And innovation meaning that we are using our existing inputs, our factors of production, in a more, in a, in a, in a better way, in a more effective way, in a more efficient way. And so this is meant to drive this crucial productivity gain. Worth saying though, that a startup and the conception that we have about startups in our mind, when we sort of popularly speak about startups, is different from entrepreneurship more broadly, right? An entrepreneur is a, a, a new firm. It's about taking risk. It's about taking risk with the aim of achieving a, pro, a profit. But entrepreneurship, more broadly, does not necessarily have to be innovative. Equally, innovation, of course, does not only come from entrepreneurs or only from startups. So innovation, as we've defined, is a new product or process. It's a new way of doing something beyond that initial invention. So when we think about startups, what we're talking about is the intersection of entrepreneurship and innovation. And I've mentioned Joseph Schumpeter, and I'll do so again, because Schumpeterian modes of entrepreneurship are at this nexus where entrepreneurship and innovation mix. So this is the, the framing. But now the research project that I'm going to primarily uh, introduce now has to do with going further. What precisely do we mean by a new firm, by a technologically oriented firm, et cetera? So the way that we designed this study is we looked at a global data set of startup-centric innovation policies. So the data set of policies that we used is that of Gen Atlas. So this is the Global Entrepreneurship Network, network and the database that's publicly available online that has almost 200 countries' innovation policies focused on startups, 
uh, and covers a, a data range of the 1980s until 2021 is the period where we ended our study. So we look at this nice broad time frame of startup policies globally oriented, right? So we're trying to capture in this first study, not regional variation and not change over time, but rather simply what across this large global data set with a nice long period of time, what is the language of policy? What's the content of startup policies in terms of how they define startups, how they operationalize startups in policy terms? So in order to do this, we used text as data methods. So we created so-called bespoke engram dictionaries, which means that we took sets of words, either individual words or two or three word uh, sort of small phrases, and we created dictionaries for each of the particular attributes of startups that we want to test for in this data set. And so our three engram dictionaries have to do first with technological nature. So we think about startups as fundamentally technologically oriented, but what's the language of policy around technology? Our second bespoke dictionary has to do with the language of ecosystems. As I mentioned with my opening quote about the point of supporting startups being about boosting the technological capacity or the innovation capacity of the Chebel, who are the actors in the ecosystems that are mentioned in these startup policies? And the third engram dictionary that, that we created is around the instruments used. So here we use the types of capital. So economic, human, physical, and social capital. So the language that's used to describe these. And using our bespoke dictionaries, which came from our analysis of a systematic literature review of academic research on startups and startup policy, using these dictionaries, we test for the connection between the startup policies in the Gen Atlas database and our different bespoke dictionaries. I should mention as well that we also used more simple um, data techniques to identify the time period, the age of a startup in the policies as well. So these are the, the four research methods that we're using or the four tools that we're using to understand precisely what are the attributes of startups in startup-centric innovation policy. Okay, so the first question, what is a startup? What is a startup in terms of its age? We have this sense in the literature that startups are ultimately about a new firm, right? And this comes from Joseph Schumpeter and it comes from the, the years of innovation studies, studies that have followed. So a startup, there's this idea that it's a new firm. So it has only been around for a certain number of years. So we first test using uh, the Gen Atlas data set to see how many years are articulated in startup policies. Are we talking about startups as being brand new firms with say just one year in existence or firms up to 10 years or 20 years of age? And what we find is that for 77% of the policies in the data set that define startups in specific age terms, 77% of those define a startup as being up to five years old. So a startup in terms of age, in terms of its novelty, needs to be, for most startup policies in the data set, up to five years old. Second question that we, that we use, and now this is our first bespoke dictionary. What is the technological nature? We have, as I've said, this expectation coming from academic research. And I would argue also in more sort of polemic or general or popular terms that a startup has to do with tech, with high tech. And maybe we will think of, of a sort of Silicon Valley type of, of innovation when we think about startups. So our expectation too, coming from the literature is that startup-centric innovation policy targets firms 
whose business models are based on frontier or cutting edge or high tech, right? This form of high tech technology. Our finding in looking at the actual language of policies is in fact that the startup policy has to do with development of firms, conducting research, technology more broadly, technology, technology transfer. The language of invention, of basic science, of blue sky research that perhaps would be at the technological frontier or conducting in-depth research and development showed much less in our findings. So the takeaway from this is that when we think about a startup from policy perspective, what we're really talking about is a firm that has a widely understood use or orientation towards technology, not necessarily technologies at the technological frontier. So for instance, not necessarily AI or blockchain or semiconductors, right? about technology broadly defined. Our third question is, what is a startup in terms of how startups are conceived in policy as they relate to the ecosystem in which they are positioned? So our expectation here is that startup-centric innovation policy uh, targets wider entrepreneurial ecosystems. Startups are not conceived of operating in a vacuum, so to speak. And this will, our expectation and the Ngram dictionary that we use uh, we'll use the language of accelerators, entrepreneurs, along with incubators, investors, universities, and also corporate and incumbent firms. Our finding here, and this is a really strong one and worth underscoring, is that 89% of policies use one or more of our entrepreneurial ecosystem engrams. And you'll see in the word cloud that presents our findings in a visual way here, that the investor, accelerator, mentor, and corporate show up to a large degree next to the language of SME. So startups and SMEs in the Gen Atlas policy data set seem to be used in many ways, perhaps interchangeably. Right? We use the language of startups and SMEs. And to say that one of the next studies that we want to use drawing on this type of research and drawing on our data set will interrogate how policy language has changed over time from, with the expectation for that being that it's evolved from SMEs and the language of small and medium-sized enterprises towards startups in more recent use. But here I'd like to underscore that startups are very much, and startup in policy terms, are conceived as operating and needing support and benefiting from support as part of an ecosystem in particular in terms of raising investment capital, uh, being part of accelerators and working with corporates and mentors to boost capabilities. Okay, our fourth expectation has to do with, well, what are the policies trying to do? What is a startup in terms of what support does it need? Right, so we've looked at the age of startups, we've looked at the nature of technology, we looked at how they are situated within the ecosystem and the different actors in which we are linking startups with in startup policy. And this test is looking at the expectation in terms of what support is given. So we can understand startups and startup policy from the perspective of what the government is looking to, to do to boost their capabilities. So here we distinguish the type of support in terms of types of capital. So we have economic capital, and here we're thinking about money funding primarily, perhaps funding for research and development, perhaps funding for uh, hiring you know, scientific and technological staff. Human capital, so here thinking about education and training. Social capital uh, in terms of boosting the network for for would-be founders and for, for founders of early stage companies and physical capital. So here thinking about infrastructure, office space, labs, et cetera. The finding here is that economic capital relatively dominates, right? With almost 30% of policies focused on giving startups 
funding of different forms. The second highest is that of human capital, and here we have just over 26%, followed by networks and social capital, and then finally physica physical capital. And I'll show on the next slide what the key words here are, because as I say, we're using natural language processing here to understand the language that is used in startup policy. So for economic capital, the terms that dominate are invest, funding, finance, financial, grants, venture capital, right? So the language of, I would argue, equity, also debt funding, debt-based debt funding for startups. Human capital, internships, training, jobs, experience. Physical capital being about office space, access to office space, particularly probably in expensive urban locations incubators and labs as well. And then finally, dominating the social capital type in terms of startup policy is the network and connecting and offering mentorship. So this is about boosting the capabilities of startups in terms of how they can draw on wider ecosystem resources, how their social network is going to be boosted. And then that will presumably help to connect them with that physical space, physical capital, economic capital, and also human capital. So we would argue that social capital seems to be very much linked uh, in thinking about it as a conduit or as a means of boosting the other types of capital. So coming all together, what do we mean a startup is in terms of startup policy? So this is from the perspective of governments drawing on our four different expectations and findings. We find that a startup is typically thought of as new, right? a young age, up to five years or less, about technology, but not a specific set of technologies and not necessarily about sort of the application of invention or at the technological frontier. Third, startups are very much conceived as being positioned in ecosystems, working with accelerators, investors, and incumbent corporate firms. The range of types of capital were there in thinking about the suite of support that startups can benefit from, um, with economic capital being the most prevalent amongst the Gen Atlas policies. Okay, so that first question, the first segment is about what is a startup from the perspective of policymakers? The second is the why, right? Why are we supporting startups? And for this, I'm drawing on a, a larger project that has been based on media analysis and policy analysis and conducting interviews across East Asia since 2017. Here I'm interested in the so-called different modes of, say, Schumpeterian innovation with sort of mode one or mode two. And let me explain what I mean by that. So public policymakers are supporting startups, as I said in the opening quote, as a means of boosting the innovation capacity of incumbent firms. In terms of economic theory, we would think that supporting startups could be about driving processes of creative destruction, where startups are, as Asai San mentioned in the introduction, where startups are driving radical innovation, and that means disrupting. Or we could think about startups as productivity enhancers for incumbent firms, that startups are engaging with corporates in order to boost the existing or incumbent firms innovation capacity. Here, startups are thought of as helping incumbent firms solve challenges that maybe keep them up at night. Right? So in thinking about these two types or these two motivations for startup policy, the first that I mentioned, that first Schumpeter, and here's a photo of Joseph Schumpeter on the screen. The first is this mode one or mark one. And here for, for Schumpeter, creative destruction is the key. This is why we would support startups. We support startups because 
startups, these new entrants is the language that Schumpeter uses in the early 20th century, are going to drive these processes of creative destruction. That means challenging, overturning the existing paradigm, in particular incumbent firms and the technologies that they are offering. On the previous slide, you had seen the Kodak uh, image. And so this is disrupting, for instance, technologies and firms like Kodak and the, the physical film industry. So the reason that we would think about supporting startups, the why from a public policy perspective is contingent here on creative destruction. Governments support startups because these new entrants are going to radically transform industry and that means making incumbent firms and their technologies obsolete. This new challenge, this new technology, new firms that are going to grow would boost systemic productivity, but it would necessarily mean challenging the existing paradigm. So this is the first explanation that we would have. The second is what I would argue is today increasingly referred to as open innovation or thinking about it in Schumpeter's terms, Schumpeter's mode two or his mark two. And here the idea is that it's large incumbent firms with access to significant, significant capital resources and know-how. It is incumbent firms who are going to lead technological progress and productivity advances. In the language of the 21st century, we think about this as open innovation. This is the work of Henry Chesbro at uh, University of California, Berkeley, who coined this term in 2003. And the reason that we support open innovation, the logic, is that the nature of the economy has changed. And in the 21st century, firms are no longer able to innovate through internal R&D. And so they are in need of accessing external resources, ideas, talent, in order to maintain their competitiveness. So incumbent firms are going to engage startups, as well as if we think about it in say a triple helix sort of context, they're going to engage their wider ecosystem, startups, universities, they're going to work with government. And startups in this open innovation paradigm are boosting the productivity of incumbent firms rather than challenging and rather than driving creative destruction as the organizing logic. So we have these two modes, these two understandings of why the state, why policy would support startups. To understand how this is happening in practice, one of the threads of research that I've been working on is mapping out how government policy supports incumbent firm interactions with startups across startup life cycles. So thinking about startups from their, their first moment when they're first founded or even before that in boosting uh, would-be entrepreneurs who are maybe in need of um, some training, say business planning de development, access to tools and logics, um, like say business model canvas or the um, lean startup method. Right? So thinking about how government policies can boost startup from the very beginning, linking with incumbent firms. So helping with say venture studios, venture builders, incubators, helping to give ideas, give uh, resource to startups at that very early nascent stage all the way through to large firms offering a campus or co-working space where they're having this sort of useful friction with startups. Looking also at how government policy encourages then these interactions in terms of accelerators, which come a bit later in the life cycle of a startup. If a startup incubator is about incubating an idea, bringing together a team, an accelerator is about accelerating either the, the growth or the failure of, of a startup. And then also about governments encouraging corporate funds, uh, corporate venture capital to boost startups progression. Going all the way through to late stage. So how incumbent firms are going to partner with 
startups and encouraging scale up programs. So here, for instance, uh, in Japan, you have programs that are boosting the number of unicorns. And this is the government encouraging relations and, and productive interactions between large incumbent firms and startups that are quite established, but have the potential or with the right support from corporates and from the state um, are capable of becoming unicorns. So privately held firms with value in excess of a billion dollars. Right? So thinking about this mode of interaction, which very much maps onto that second mode or the second rationale for startup support from a public policy perspective. So that of open innovation and about startups as a means of boosting the productivity capacity of large firms, of existing firms. So collectively, what does this mean? So we've worked to map out how these different mechanisms, different modes of state support for startups uh, can be understood in terms of the core objectives. Right? So there's two types, and this is work that I've done with Ramon Pacheco Cardo. There's two objectives ultimately in terms of these incumbent startup interactions. The first objective from the perspective of public policy is to boost incumbent firms' access to innovation capacity and ideas. So this very much aligns with that quote that I started with, that supporting startups is ultimately about injecting ideas and innovative DNA into large and existing firms. And to deliver on this objective, there's a number of forms of involvement that governments have taken. So encouraging and supporting accelerators, incubators, uh, encouraging and giving, say, tax subsidies uh, for co-working spaces or campuses, and encouraging uh, large firms to act as judges or on committees for policies uh, and funding that is going to startups. The second overall objective is around the access to talent. So working for a startup, either as a founder or as an early employee, is conceived in startup policy as a means of changing or boosting human capital, that changing the labor pool, boosting that entrepreneurial mindset that asai Sun mentioned at the start. So policies here are conceiving of startup policy as a means for incumbent firms to access new and different talent. So here we see programs from the state that allow employees or encourage employees of existing firms to have secondments, internships at startups, particularly established startups, say venture back, venture capital back startups. Also encouraging and enabling spinoffs and boosting that social capital through networking, mentoring, and advisory programs. So there's this range of forms or tools that states use to boost startup-centric innovation to deliver on these two core objectives of boosting incumbents' access to innovation, as well as their access to talent. So it's about ideas, capacity, and talent. Okay, so to conclude through the studies that I've talked through, we, we're working to more precisely conceptualize and operationalize startup in the context of innovation policy and entrepreneurship policy. So the first question and the first thrust of what I've talked through is based upon an analysis of the Global Entrepreneurship Network Atlas database. So looking at startups in terms of four expectations that come from the literature. So one, the age of startups. We find that they are young firms, typically less than five years old. So that's 77% of the um, policies that talk about age say less up to five years old. Second, technology oriented, but not necessarily at the technological frontier. Third, startups are understood in policy terms as engaging with a range of ecosystem actors, including investors, corporates, or incumbent firms, and also connecting them with accelerators and incubators. And fourth, and our, our final expectation, 
is in terms of the type of support that is allocated. So this is primarily in need of economic capital. So here we saw invest, funding, financing, venture capital, and then human capital being second. So here we saw intern, train, education. So given the involvement of incumbent firms in startup policies, we conclude that often the implicit aim is to boost the productivity through open innovation, or that second Schumpeterian mode or mark, where the aim of supporting startups is boosting systemic productivity by injecting that innovative DNA into incumbent firms. So this augurs particularly well for established firms or incumbent firms. It does raise questions about the world in which we're living. Is it that first Schumpeter where startups should be driving productivity advances by challenging through that creative destruction or by open innovation and boosting the productivity capacity of established or incumbent firms. So which Schumpeter is it that we're after given the attributes of our economy now in 2023? So that's that's it from me. I have now just to, to say thank you, and I look forward to hearing your questions and continuing the conversation with Asai San. Thank you so much for your wonderful and detailed presentation, which was very informative. And in fact, it was an eye-opening session uh, for our viewers as well as for us to learn the study results of a startup-centric innovation policy, uh, which definitely provided, I believe, that the policy makers for uh, actionable insights and also strategic benefits for large existing firm as well. Uh, so you also kindly explained in details about what is a startup, ecosystem support, technological nature, type of capital required, including the economic, human, social, and physical capitals. Uh, you also touched upon the open innovation and how startups boost their productivity for uh, improvement uh, firms. And uh, first of all, I must say thank you for sharing your insightful presentation with us. And uh, now uh, we open the floor for uh, Q&A sessions. Yeah, uh, we received a question from Mr. Amit Kumar. Uh, thank you. When organizations grew, uh, there are bureaucratic processes and mentality built up inside organizations or employees. How traditional organizational leadership practice uh, startup-centric innovation? This is a question from Amit Kumar. So what is your insights on that? That's a great question. Uh, thank you, Amit. I think there's two thrusts of, of what I would say. One is this idea of entrepreneurship, right? That within a large firm, you can hang on to, you can embrace this idea that uh, you can be creative, you can be disruptive, you can drive innovation. And so you see firms uh, that offer, say, rewards for filing patents and for bringing new ideas. So. Uh, you know, Google comes to mind as a firm that encourages its employees to continue pushing and innovating and has a process for rewarding and encouraging this kind of activity. The second, I would say, is very much around this idea of working with the outside uh, ecosystem, particularly working with startups and having a more porous border that brings the, the challenge and the ideas into firms as they're growing, as they're scaling up, and as they become the, the large uh, leading on, uh, incumbent firms. So, you know, thinking about the, the difference between, the, say, if I use Google again, you know, which starts in a garage and is very innovative and disruptive and wanted to change the world, but then it becomes a massive employer and it becomes in itself a, a large uh, firm similarly with Alibaba and, and with others. 
So how do you hang on to that? And I think part of it is about culture and, and, and purposefully maintaining that culture of pushing and driving and innovating. But second, what has arisen particularly in the 21st century with this idea of open innovation, that it's working with startups, working with entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, for instance, I'm thinking of a conversation I had mentioned that, you know, what keeps you up late at night? That came from an interview that I did years ago um, in Hong Kong with a, a corporate that has uh, a, an incubator lab in, in Central that asks itself on a regular basis, what keeps us up late at night? What worries us? And they then organize uh, labs and incubator programs to work with startups to push and to challenge and to think about how they can change or how they can adapt their core business and operations uh, to have access to those new and challenging ideas. So I think it's, it's two, it's a sort of entrepreneurship and it's boosting or maintaining purposefully that culture of creativity and, and challenge. But then secondly, that porous border and working with outside firms to understand what's coming and what can we do more or do differently. Uh, thank you so much, Robin, for your uh, wonderful insights, particularly quoting about uh, the uh, Hong Kong case. Um, that is really uh, like insightful for us. And uh, we have a next question uh, from our viewers. Yes, uh, this is uh, from Tarismal uh, Kalkina Gunsu. So the question goes like this, how can developing countries integrate startups with the existing traditional ecosystem players, such as research institutes uh, in a traditional sector. So if the connection of research institute is a weak. So how do you see uh, this question from your perspective? That's a great question, uh, Terminal. I would say that in developing contexts, there's aspects or attributes that are different, but then there's also something that's going to be uh, relatively you know, sort of universal, if you will. Um, traditional ecosystem, if we think about that, uh, that triple helix or the variety of ecosystem players, research institutes being just one of those, right? So if I think about the Gen Atlas findings, what we see from a policy perspective, it's very much about the investors, the, the accelerators and incubators, which aren't necessarily, as you say, the traditional or research institute, research institute being just one of those. And in, in many ways, when there isn't such a established traditional or incumbent sort of logic or paradigm, uh, it means that there isn't that resistance to, to challenge or to adapt or to try new. So I think you often will see sort of this very entrepreneurial spirit um, and also this sort of leapfrogging capabilities because there isn't the sort of resistance to say, well, no, this is how we do it here. And this is the, if you think about research institutes and you know, if we think about uh, ITRI in Taiwan, which has been essential in knowledge transfer around say semiconductors since the 1980s, this is one model of, of boosting really technological frontier innovation, uh, starting with startups and then grow over time. Uh, but that's just, that's just one mode. And without that, and the nature of ecosystems today is that there's a range of different actors that can come together to contribute um, to, to try really, as you mentioned before, radically different or disruptive uh, approaches or technologies. And the other thing that I would say is that the nature of startup centric innovation is, is fundamentally open in a global or spatial sense uh, where innovation doesn't only happen within a particular country or city or locale, uh, that ecosystems are connected across geographies, um, particularly in terms of digital uh, technologies. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, I very well agreed your point that innovation could happen anywhere. It's not necessarily, it should happen only in a very technology, like advanced country. It could happen in even underdeveloping countries. So the, the, I think uh, I'm, I'm 
fully very much agreed on that point. And we have a couple of more questions from our audience. Uh, yes, uh, again, uh, Mr. Thierry Small, yeah, thank you for your appeal to organize these great events and the brilliant presentations. Uh, how can those countries convince traditional planners or controversies, traditional investors to make investment? That's a very interesting question. Uh, how do you take on that? It is. So you mentioned that there's an opportunity um, across um, across countries, regardless of level of development. And right. I think maybe it links nicely with the work that we're doing on inclusive innovation. So I think this is something that, you know, what's, what's the point of innovation, right? If productivity and economic growth is the aim, that's perhaps one dimensional. And what we're increasingly seeing is that there's a social purpose, there's a direction for innovation. And this idea of, of as you mentioned, of traditional planners or um, traditional investors, increasingly startups and, and this mode of innovation is about, well, what's the social purpose? How does this deliver on uh, boosting the quality of life for a variety of, of members of society? You increasingly see, although it's not fully joined up, uh, you increasingly see collaboration across ministries that typically wouldn't have necessarily worked together before. So a ministry of science and technology working with a ministry of social affairs, working with the ministry of education and thinking about, well, how do we, how do we advance? How do we evolve? How do we upskill so that we have the capabilities, the human capital, the mindset uh, that you had mentioned at the opening, so that we're better positioned to, to compete. And so I think this is a really exciting moment where the social purpose of innovation, the, the importance of directionality and inclusion being something that perhaps is making it easier, as you say, for traditional planners uh, to embrace new and, and different uh, approaches. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Robin. And uh, I have a, one question from your one of your slides. Uh, you mentioned that particularly about um, startup-centric innovation policy focus. You, you are categorically mentioned in your findings that technology-oriented activities, but not necessarily at the technological frontiers. Uh, this is something uh, uh, like a pop-up me. So, could you just give more explain about what exactly the technological frontier which you mentioned in that conclusion? I would like to uh, like have more insights on that. Yes, absolutely. So in, in many ways, when we think about innovation policy that's captured headlines or interest, we'll think about policies like say Made in China 2025, which says these are the technologies that are at the technological frontier that we want to be at the world's sort of leading position. Right? So here we think AI and blockchain, semiconductors. In the UK, for instance, recently, we've also identified a number of these technologies at the world frontier where we want to boost UK innovation capacity. When looking at startup centric innovation policy, thinking about how it's historically been a driver for sort of catching up and boosting national technological capacity, national uh, economic competitiveness. The expectation perhaps is that the aim of startup policies is in boosting at that technological frontier. So this was our expectation going in, thinking about what's coming from academic literature and, and also what's in the sort of psyche of these, these policies that dominate. So we use the language of the technological frontier. So uh, patents, R&D, uh, invention, uh, blue sky, basic science, et cetera. What I want to do as the next study, and for viewers who are listening, if you're interested in this, uh, get in touch. I, I want to look at specific technologies and, rather, and test whether instead of these very let's say descriptors of the technological frontier. So the blue sky, basic science, uh, patents, et cetera. Instead of this terminology, 
is what we're seeing in public policy, like what is done in Made in China 2025, uh, where governments are saying these are the specific technologies where we want to be world leaders. And this is that in innovation policy, more broadly, not only startups, is something that we've seen, you know, if I think about uh, the Taiwanese trajectory, for instance, since the 1970s, a tax rebate was given every year for companies that were operating in specific technologies. And each and every year, the government said, this is the world's technological frontier. We're going to give, we're going to give tax rebates for companies that are working only right here. So this is something that's been around for you know, 50 years in the context of science and technology innovation policy. What I'm curious to see is, are startups conceived in terms of startup policies in the same way? Or is innovation policy more broadly about this invention and technological frontier and startups are more about commercialization and boosting the capacity of incumbent firms? Very well agreed. Thank you so much on that uh, uh, thoughtful sharing. And yes, we have a lot of questions uh, from our viewers. And uh, yeah, uh, I will check this question from Mr. Amit Kumar again. Uh, you mentioned about uh, Google, but recently Google also behind on the bringing innovation of a generative AI field. Uh, don't you think uh, Google may also build those bureaucratic mindsets as well? So what's your on thoughts on this? It's, an, it's a great question and it's a really difficult a challenge to maintain that you know you know Google's phrase has been you know don't do evil and this you know we're we're disruptive we're, we're challengers it was also of course of course you know Apple this was you know when you're the small you're the outsider you're the startup you're the challenger that personality let's say that culture is natural maintaining that when you have tens of thousands of employees and you have to hit quarterly numbers and you have, as you say, bureaucratic corporate expectations and procedures is a fundamental challenge. And if I go back to Schumpeter, for me, this is a question or a debate that is worth having that I would argue in many ways isn't actually happening at the moment. I think that that open innovation mode is sort of the prevailing paradigm from a policy perspective of startups can help inject innovative uh, DNA into now incumbent firms like Google with the expectation that you know, Google's uh, support for entrepreneurs, for instance, can can help, I'm thinking about Google and DeepMind and the generative AI uh, context that you mentioned. This is the mode that we're in now. I do wonder, and I, I think that your question is very much striking at this, if that first Schumpeterian mode, that first mode where startups are driving productivity gains because they disrupt, not because they boost the capabilities of what's now large firms like Google, but startups should be supported perhaps in their own right as disruptors, right? Driving this creative destruction. So I think it's a, it's a great question. Excellent, excellent sharing. Thank you so much. I uh, hope Amit, uh, you got the answer from uh, Dr. Robin. And yes, uh, we have, yes, we can take this question as well. Um, even leaders have the startup mentality. There are always hesitation on risk taking or mindset because of the stakeholders traditional mentality i think that this is yeah they cannot move forward with the new ideas or innovation uh what's your comment on that this comes back to the the two schumpeter modes again for me that again that depending on the world that we see ourselves operating in right if if the expectation is that injection of new ideas entrepreneurial creative talent into large firms if that is going to drive innovation capacity it's going to to boost the productivity propensity then yes but as you are suggesting at the perhaps if we go back to the first mode of schumpeter that startups and entrepreneurs 
are going to be those new entrants that challenge and disrupt and that that's the key, then the sort of line of your comment and questioning is very much aligned with that of uh, that of Schumpeter more than 100 years ago, right? I mean, over the course of his life, he changed his view. And I think it's worth remembering that, right? In the, the first mode that new entrants are driving this cr useful creative destruction process, this is in the 1910s. But then he watched over the course of his life, large firms with huge amounts of capital and talent, say for instance, uh, AT&T, these companies, he said, are driving society's big advances, right? The innovations that are shaping productivity and making the quality of life better. And then when he writes in the early 1940s, he has this second mode, that second mark, which is very much that, well, actually, maybe these large like oligopolistic firms are the engine, right, of, of capitalism in particular sectors where access to capital and having your talent internally is, is the way. The question is today, Henry Chesbro in 2003 said, we are now in a paradigm of open innovation, which I would say still aligns very much with Schumpeter's 1940s idea. The question that I think is worth asking today is, why are we supporting startups? Is it because, and, and I would argue in this line of, of research that we've been talking about, is very much interested in, in encouraging or maybe instigating a conversation about what is it that's really the, the purpose? Why are we supporting startups? Are they disruptors in their own right, driving that radical innovation that's going to challenge and overthrow? Or are they driving incremental innovation for the purposes of large established firms? Thank you so much. Thank you. I have one question um, again from one of your slides. So you explained about the startup life cycles and how incubants uh, connected with the startup life cycles and, and in, including accelerator, incubator, and other players. Uh, from if your perspective, like international organizations, uh, how if you like organizations could play a kind of vital role uh, creating to, towards creating kind of a, a more favorable ecosystem for startups? It's a great question. The countries and regions that are, I would argue, doing the most impactful startup uh, centric innovation policy work are those who are identifying the specific gaps that they have locally. So uh, for instance, a, a number of years ago in Singapore, in that sort of 2016, 17 period, they identified that series A, right, early stage venture capital funding is where they were really lacking. And this is where startups needed support. In different startup ecosystems in different country contexts or even different city contexts, there will be a, a different sort of relative gap. And I think the role for organizations like APO is twofold. I think it's one, helping to do conduct research, first to understand what is the gap, where are the capabilities that are missing? Uh, and then second, once the gap is identified, what are the modes of support that are necessary? Is it about the lack of funding and, and economic capital? Is it about building that social capital, those networks that are all important? Or is it about physical capital, right? Access to accelerators and incubators, um, you know, in, in places that are really expensive, right? That's a challenge for startups um, where office space is, is something that can be an inhibitor for, for starting up and then equally the human capital. And I think one of the moments that's really fascinating now about supporting startups is, or one of the aspects of the current moment is thinking, well, what are the tools that are needed to start up? You know, earlier we had the question on generative AI. So much now can be achieved using a wide range of tools as a founder, right? The creation of Amazon Web Services in 2006 meant that startups could start up much cheaper and easier. Now we have generative AI, which also means we have a commoditization of a wide range of skills. So what skills, what's, what's missing and how can 
that be more precisely supported. I think that's the aim of, of the APO, or that's the work that can be done to actually move the needle and thinking about that direction or the purpose, right? Why are we supporting startups? Who, who benefits? Thank you so much. Uh, yes, definitely I agree. First, we need to identify the gap where. So by, while doing the research, then we can identify the gap. Then as a kind of second step, we can look at it, uh, what kind of uh, uh, like a support system we can create for them to like connecting accelerator or incubator. So I think that kind of roles could be a kind of a doable, I believe. Thank you so much for your insights. Okay. And yes, I think uh, we are already running out of time. And uh, I take this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. I think still we have some questions, but uh, um, since we are running out of time, let's take a final um, message. And um, yes, uh, this is my um, uh, remarks uh, for having you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Robin, for your in valuable insights and i believe all of our founders uh, so viewers found uh, this information and insights very useful uh, in the yes i would request um, all of our viewers uh, still you can post your questions in the chat box uh, we will try to answer or uh, collect all the questions and answer after the session uh, thank you so much. And uh, this APO productivity talk uh, usually helps uh, weekly once. And uh, please watch out our APO YouTube channel for um, interesting topics coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, so please subscribe to this channel and stay tuned. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Robin. Thank you so much. Thank Goodbye. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Asai. Thank you.